Well, we have finished Descartes' meditations, and uh, next we're going to go on to Hegel's phenomenology. Um, normally, these two philosophers are thought of uh, as rather different, uh, but I want to uh, show how we get from one to the other and suggest that, uh, in fact, they're not entirely different. So I've uh, entitled this talk, uh, which is uh, lecture 13, uh, German Idealism, Descartes to Sartre. Now, this is a little odd because the tradition of German idealism usually is traced from Kant through Hegel, Feuerbach, Mar Feuerbach Marx, perhaps Nietzsche, all of whom obviously wrote and uh, thought in German. Sartre was French, although he had ancestors from Alsace, which is the most German part of France. Uh, Albert Schweitzer was his cousin, and uh, he was influenced by the philosopher Heidegger, with whom he studied at one point, and participated in the recovery of the writings of the young Hegel and the young Marx in, in France in the 1930s. Uh, Descartes, however, had no connection, direct connection to Germany, indeed, Cartesian clarity uh, is often contrasted with German wooliness and thought to be the hallmark of distinctively French philosophy. So a starting point from uh, Descartes to Sartre uh, demands some explanation. There is, however, in fact, a line of argument running from Descartes through Hegel uh, and onward to Sartre by means of Kant. As French philosophers go, Sartre was rather uncartesian, or at least a rebel against received French philosophy of his day. However, Descartes' influence is uh, conveyed also through the legacies of Kant and Hegel. One might regard Descartes as the original existentialist, um, in that he pioneers a point of view in philosophy which takes as its starting point individual consciousness. Kant carries this forward. Hegel follows up. So I've put berets on all of them to, to suggest uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, an existentialist interpretation of all of these philosophers. Um, Kant's notion of freedom, autonomy, will undergo further development by Hegel and Sartre. So first of all, Hegel gets from Kant two things, uh, an epistemological point and an ethical point. The epistemological point has to do with Kant's notion of autonomy, or sorry, of phenomena and uh, the ethical point from Kant's notion of autonomy. Kant in turn gets from Descartes the notion that knowledge proceeds from the standpoint of the perceiving subject. What makes Descartes seem the progenitor of German idealism is exactly the same thing that makes him the first modern philosopher. And that is he asks the question, how much is it, how much if my, of my perception of the world, how much of it is my perception of the world and how much of it is my perception of the world? Uh, I told the joke earlier uh, in the discussion of Descartes about the, the old man who goes to the doctor because uh, he's afraid that his wife is going deaf and um, discovers um, that it possibly she's not. It, is the world going deaf to me or am I going deaf to the world? That's an important question. Descartes starts from the standpoint of the perceiving subject and asks whether his perception conveys anything of the object world in which it purports to be a perception. So I have a perception of a tree. Does an actual tree cause my perception of the tree? And even if it does, does my perception resemble its object, uh, that putative tree? It's a question. Kant concurs, we have to start from the standpoint of the perceiving subject. He too is skeptical that we can go from the phenomena of perception, as he calls them, to what he calls the noumenal objects, the things in themselves which might be the causes of our phenomenal consciousness. So it too is a question. Now, in Kant's epistemology, we have no direct access to noumena, things as they are themselves. What we have access to most directly is the phenomena. And this comes from the Greek word phino, uh, which means to appear, the phenomena of our perceptions. Plato was confident that we might bypass uh, doxa, as the Greeks called it, that which appears phenomenally, and get to episteme, knowledge of things in themselves, in Kant's terms, noumena. Kant does not share Plato's confidence, and this is due to the influence of Descartes. Kant, too, would like to get to, to noumena, if this is honestly possible, uh, but he is aware that phenomena interpose themselves between subject and object. Now, although as we've just seen, Kant gets this from Descartes, taking the point of view of the subjective observer is often credited as uh, Kant's Copernican revolution in knowledge, so to speak. 
the analogy here, of course, is to Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus dethroned Earth from the center of the cosmos in favor of seeing the sun as the center of the solar system and our solar system as being one of many uh, billions and billions, as Carl Sagan would have said. Uh, and the analogy is that Kant dethrones the numinal object in favor of perceptual phenomena. Let's look at a, a brief video here about that development. Sigmund Freud acknowledged that two great scientific revolutions had transformed humanity. We used to believe that Earth was at the center of the universe and that everything else revolved around us. In the 16th century, Nicolaus Copernicus and other astronomers demonstrated that the planets moved around the sun in what we now know as the solar system. The second upheaval in thought occurred in 1859, when Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species. Before that, human beings had thought they were special, a species apart. What Darwin demonstrated was that we had evolved from ancestors we shared with other animals. Freud identified a third revolution, a revolution that he had himself instigated. Before psychoanalysis, it was common to think of the mind as fully conscious and acting on the basis of reason. Freud's research into the unconscious and the spell it cast over all our actions undermined that way of thinking. And of course, Freud thought that he was up there with Copernicus and uh, Darwin. Uh, he neglects, of course, the Thales revolution, as we've uh, mentioned before. But still, uh, three major revolutions in our ways of looking at ourselves. Um, J.G.C. Smart, uh, the Australian philosopher, commented uh, about Kant's Copernican revolution. Kant's so-called Copernican revolution was really an anti-Copernican counter-revolution. Just when man was being taken away from the, thing, the, the center of all things by the astronomers, and when he was soon to be put in his biological place by the theory of evolution, Kant was putting him back in the center again. Well, to the extent that this was an anti-Copernican counter-revolution, Kant didn't start it, uh, Descartes did. The Cartesian influence on epistemology is going to carry over from Kant to Hegel. Likewise, the importance of freedom, autonomy, as uh, Kant says, is going to carry over uh, by means of Hegel from Kant's ethics to figures like Feuerbach's, uh, Mar Fe Feuerbach, Marx, <laughs> Nietzsche, and South. I said Feuerbach, but I want to suggest that Feuerbach and Marx are really quite, uh, quite similar. And indeed, also to some thinkers outside philosophy as such uh, in the social sciences. We'll see that when we come to the next lecture directly about Hegel. From Kant, Hegel gets two things. From his epistemology, he gets the notion of phenomena, and this is going to lead to what, what uh, Hegel is going to call the phenomenology of mind or of spirit. And from Kant's ethics, Hegel gets the notion of autonomy. Well, let's look at these two in a little more detail. Kant gets, Hegel gets from Kant, sorry, the notion of phenomena. Hegel's going to make virtue out of the Copernican necessity uh, where some would see a tenuous connection between noumena and phenomena as a liability, Hegel's going to ignore this difficulty, and he's going to take up Kant's notion of phenomena without worrying about any noumenal connection in order to explore how phenomenal perception works itself out, considered from within the standpoint of the subjective consciousness. And this is why Hegel calls his first book, the one we're going to read, by a word that's new to philosophy, phenomenology. Hmm? Second thing Hegel gets from Kant is the notion of autonomy. Now we looked at this a little, briefly a little bit before. Uh, it, the word comes from its Greek roots, uh, auto for self and nomos for governance. Um, so for example, an automobile is a self-propelled vehicle and um, uh, nomi, uh, heteronomy, autonomy, uh, etc., cetera, is, is to be governed. For Kant, where most human when we act in an autonomous manner, that is to say in a free and self-directed manner, to the extent that we do otherwise, our humanity is diminished. Now, lots of other people have said more or less the same thing. What's particularly interesting about Kant is that he makes autonomous action the foundation of ethical obligation, and this is most unusual. Kant is the modern philosopher of ethical duty. And again, we discussed this uh, in the section on ethics uh, at the beginning of the course. He's also the philosopher of human freedom. For Kant, duty and freedom are not opposed. They go hand in glove. 
For Kant, a duty is not an external command upon me. It's the free embrace by each individual of what reason shows me to be imperative. And reason, Kant thinks of as the individual capacity to be universal. For Kant, if I do the right, what, what is objectively the right thing, but I do it merely in response to somebody else's external command, well then my action is not really ethical. Ethics is not a matter just of doing the right act, but of doing it also for the right reason and the right spirit. For example, gratuitously killing another human being is not a good thing to do. But if I refrain from doing that, if I refrain from murder just because it's illegal or because I'm afraid to anger the gods, uh, I'm not doing my duty and I'm not acting ethically. Only if I refrain from murder because I see how not refraining violates the categorical imperative, am I acting rightly? And again, this for you guys is a way, by way of review. On the other hand, if I do act rightly, recognizing, for instance, that everyone has a right to live just as I also have the right, uh, that I would not want to endorse the kind of world in which anyone might gratuitously take another person's life. Simultaneously, then I'm doing what's good for humanity as a whole, and I'm also acting in accord with my own true inner nature. So Kant's way of looking at ethical obligations and duties is not the usual way. Most people view duty as an external imposition, a monkey on my back, uh, so to say. The usual way of looking at duty in this fashion uh, is what Kant calls heteronymous. Okay, here's an example of heteronomy. When a Navy ship hits port, yay, everybody's happy because they get liberty. They get, you know, basically a, a pass to go ashore for maybe 24, 48 hours, something in that order. Of course, not all sailors get liberty, some of them get the duty. That somebody has to stay, a skeleton who has to stay on board ship to keep it running, to safeguard it, etc. Now, this is a normal way of looking at things. Normally we tend to contrast duty and inclination. Okay, duty is something we do despite ourselves because we're compelled to do it, but which otherwise we wouldn't do. So when swabbies hit port, they don't want the duty, they want liberty. Hmm? The word heteronomy comes from the Greek, uh, heteros, uh, meaning other, nomos, meaning law. So, for example, heterosexuality is sexual sex with an other sex, the opposite sex. Uh, determination by forces outside oneself is heteronomy, and heteronomy, of course, the rule for slaves. Autonomy, again, also from the Greek, autos, like an automobile, nomos, uh, law. Determination by oneself alone, and this is the rule for free people. Let me give you some examples. There's a difference between cooking and baking. Baking is heteronymous. You've got to follow the directions, okay? If you don't get the right amount of yeast and baking powder and that kind of stuff, then your cake's not going to work. Cooking is autonomous. Just, you know, visualize the dish you want to finish with, what you want to eat, then just do it. I like Nigella Lawson. Um, she adds a series of radio segments. Cook your pantry, you know? Go into your pantry, see what's there, and uh, make a meal of it. Um, it's uh, it's fun it's a fun uh, game to uh, to go to the ninety nine cent store and see if you can find ingredients there that will produce a decent meal. You can always find something to eat in the ninety nine cent store. That's not hard, but uh, but the challenge is to find uh, to find a good meal there. And you can do it. You know, it's possible to do it. It's kind of like the, the French play a game called RPQ, Qualité. Let's see if I can get a good lunch for under $10. Can you eat for under $10? You can go to McDo's, McDonald's, but, but can you find a good restaurant with a properly prepared meal and good wine for under $10? It can be done, you know, um, but, uh, but you have to work at it. Okay, so, so baking is heteronymous, cooking is autonomous. Dogs are heteronymous, cats are autonomous, you know? Dogs, can I get your paper? Get your slip. Cats are, yeah, can you change the channel and get me some catnip? You know, no jurisdiction requires a cat license because cats don't have owners, cats have staff. Uh, dogs always have to be licensed, that's the difference. Here's another example classical music is heteronymous. Okay, if you're going to play a classical composition. The way to do that is to follow exactly the, the score that's written in front of you, to play it exactly as the composer would have intended it to be heard, to play it exactly as the original audience would have heard it, even down to uh, the exact instruments. I have a favorite recording of Mozart's four horn concertos, for example. Uh, and normally the horn concertos are done with an English horn or a French horn, the, the valve horns that we normally see. But 
they didn't exist in Mozart's time. So Mozart wrote it for what's called a Naturhorn. It's, uh, it's like the difference between a bugle and a trumpet. It doesn't have any vowels. And Hermann Baumann uh, did a performance of Mozart's uh, four horn concertos using that original instrument because he wanted that performance to sound exactly like it would have sounded to Mozart's uh, audience. Um, classical music is heteronymous. Bebop jazz is autonomous. Okay, if you're going to play bebop, you want to play a solo on usually a standard ballad that nobody else has ever performed before. And, and uh, bebop musicians uh, train themselves by having what they call cutting contests. That is, one solo would follow the next, and you try to cut the guy before you. That's you try to outdo the guy uh, by playing a solo on the same tune that you're all playing, uh, different from his, uh, an innovation, complete innovation, um, not following uh, any preset pattern indeed. If you did, if you played something standard and something canned, you lost face. So classical music is heteronymous, bebop jazz is autonomous. Students uh, have a choice between heteronomy and autonomy. Uh, you know, you can say, as this guy does, well, I'm taking this class only because it's required by my bosses. So I'll go through the motions and got me through K-12, but basically I don't give a crap. I'm doing it instrumentally. I'm trying to get a grade. And more important, I'm trying to go out to things in the real world, right? So there, yeah, yeah. One can also take this attitude. Uh, I'm taking this class because it fits into a long-term game plan to cultivate my life and to grow myself. I'm doing it proactively. I'm not just reacting to external degree requirements. Though incidentally, by the way, this game plan does fulfill those requirements going to get me a degree into the bargain. Most of the time, most people, children especially, uh, follow, following rules seems to be a heteronymous activity. You're not the boss of me, right? Um, but notice this, cooking as opposed to baking, bebop as opposed to classical is not just pure free form. It's not no rules whatsoever. Throwing random things into a pot is not cooking. Just as turning the pot over and banging on it is not music either. Cooking and drumming are both rule governed activities. The difference is attitudinal. Do you follow the rules slavishly or do you follow rules so long as the rules are rational and you, the follower, are discerning about them? Is stopping for a stop sign heteronymous? Is a stop sign just stoptional? Is refusing to stop for that stop sign autonomous? Autonomy isn't just contrarianism. Uh, the test of whether I'm acting freely is not, do my actions differ from those of other people? I may stop for a stop sign heteronymous, heteronymous because I don't want to get a ticket, but I may also do so autonomously since everybody benefits from everyone stopping. Uh, I wouldn't wish a world in which uh, people gr would uh, gratuitously run the stop signs. That's uh, sort of Kantian rationale. In fact, if everyone agrees with me, this isn't necessarily a sign that I am either unfree or behaving slavishly. You're not the boss of me. Well, do I really want to grow up only to be a big child? Um, we can think about this in terms of wine. If you learn to drink wine, and I hope you do, um, you'll soon encounter a set of rules, capital R. The first of which is red with meat, white with fish. And there are some others who drink white wine before red, you drink young wine before old, you drink dry wine before sweet, colder wine before warmer wine, claret with lamb, sauterne with roquefort, German Riesling by itself, and no wine goes with chocolate. Now, here are the rules. So apply these rules to the wine list I've just handed you, sir. Hmm? Uh, let's look at a clip from the film, uh, The Blues Brothers. Wrong glass, sir. Ah, yes. They are enjoying that Dom Perignon. Um, if you don't know the rules, the sommelier, the wine steward, probably some snooty frog, uh, is going to make you pay, sir. How is it that some people can say sir and make it rhyme with and mean F you? I don't know. It happens. But it's possible to approach the rules in either an autonomous or heteronymous manner. Um, Heteronymous matter, one can treat the rules as a monkey sitting on one's back, an external imposition opposed uh, from above by the overbearing sommelier, for example. 
or one can act autonomously of apprehending the rules as an extension of one's own inner nature, uh, the sort of thing one would just do naturally. Hmm? The rules, if truly they are rules, may rule us uh, because they are just the sorts of things that an autonomous person would work out for himself. There's an interesting book, it's about 25 years old now, uh, called Red Wine with Fish. Hmm? Remember the basic rule is red with meat, white with fish, but under certain circumstances, it makes sense with certain kinds of fish to have certain kinds of red wine, and indeed with certain kinds of meat to have certain kinds of white wine. That's the point of this book. They, they give a rationale for doing that, and they also give some recipes. Um, it's, uh, it's worth having a look at, red wine with fish. Rules may be based on experience. Perhaps the relevant experience is open to all comers. On the other hand, sometimes what passes for rules may be based on a misunderstanding. Um, so Rosengarten and Wesson, the authors of this book, um, find that some standard rules are useful because they represent the fruits of common experience and the sorts of things that would work out for myself. Some rules are exaggerations of what would otherwise be good ideas, uh, which can be corrected in light of improved knowledge. And there are some general principles of chemistry and taste that can be applied. For example, if you try drinking a very tannic red wine, uh, Bordeaux or other Cabernet Sauvignon with a fishy fish like trout, you're going to quickly form your own rule. Yuck. Ugh. It's a nasty experience. Do not put this in your mouth. And likewise, if you try drinking a rich sweet wine like a Sauvignon uh, with a fishy fish like trout, you're going to discover also yuck. But strangely enough, a sweet wine like this is a really good match with a salty pungent blue cheese like Roquefort. Mm -hmm. Classic match. Um, now, not all fishes are alike. Unlike trout, salmon is not a very fishy fish. Uh, tuna, another good example. Uh, so these can go well with red Pinot Noir, including fine burgundy. So sometimes red wine with fish or with a good Beaujolais. Again, a light red wine from the, the Gamay grape uh, can go well with a non-fishy fish. Claret, um, red Bordeaux basically, which is made primarily from the Cabernet Sauvignon grape, is the classic match with lamb. Um, I think about my own professor, uh, Richard Rubenstein, um, who uh, taught us about this at uh, Florida State. He had a famous uh, wine lecture that uh, he would launch into uh, spontaneously uh, once a chair, but he waited to hear this one. It was a good lecture. Um, whether it's uh, young or tannic, whether it's aged with tannins or mellowed out, uh, it's all good uh, claret with lamb. Uh, but Rosengarten and Wesson pair a two-year-old white burgundy made from the Chardonnay grape with uh, spicy fried lamb chops. Uh, and note that certain red wine pairings would not work with this particular preparation. So sometimes uh, you can have white with meat. My teacher's teacher, Brian Wilson, who's up at All Souls, uh, uh, sarcastically said to me one day, uh, well, you know, Riesling, it's just, just for women's colleges in the summertime. And that's the kind of standard, particularly in England, the standard view of uh, what Riesling is. Uh, it's thought of as a sweet wine, just too cloyingly sweet to pair with any food, although it might be a thirst quencher on a hot day. But Schloss Vollrads, which is one of the, the great uh, German uh, Rieslings, um, is, uh, is a bestseller in Japan, uh, where it's often uh, paired with sushi. So try a qualitative meat body cut like a cabinet uh, and, uh, and you'll be pleasantly surprised. So tell the sommelier to take a hike and own the rules for yourself, if not necessarily quite like the Blues Brothers did. I take it that Rosengarten and Wesson are not just giving a commercial for Outback Steakhouse. They're not saying that no rules, just right. Uh, but they're recommending that rules be followed and formulated but in an autonomous manner. Work smarter, not harder, is their point, I think. Um, and th that was Kant's point about rules, including moral rules. We should expect duty to coincide with inclination not to fight it. So Philosoraptor asks the question, if someone tells you that you should form your own opinions, act autonomously in other words, and you agree with them, are you still following their advice? And if you agree with someone else, are you really forming your own opinions? Kant would answer yes to both these questions. If you follow someone else's advice to be free, you're still being free. And you might readily form an autonomous choice which coincides with others' autonomous choices, everybody stopping at the stop sign, for example. Autonomy is not just contrarianism. Hmm? Heteronomy is not just the fact of agreement with someone else's opinion. Not only does the content of what I do or say matter, my reasons for doing so also matter. In an important sense, contrarianism 
is just heteronomy. It's defining yourself reactively by someone else's agenda. So it may, it may set out to be independent, but it's in fact dependent. Now, following Kant's lead, Hegel is going to explore the birth of society through the choice to act either autonomously or heteronomously. And he's going to do so furthermore by tracing the phenomenology of human consciousness and its evolutions. So we find that, that Hegel, sorry, stood on the shoulders of Aristotle as well as of Descartes and Kant. Feuerbach, Marx, Nietzsche, Schaut, Weber, Durkheim, Freud, George Herbert Mead, Cooley, Charles Martin Cooley, Riesman, Marcuse, Galbraith, and others stood in their turn on the shoulders of Hegel, as we'll see in the next lecture. In particular, Descartes was the first modern philosopher in as much as he recognized that knowledge must start from the standpoint of the knower. Kant's Copernican revolution followed Descartes' epistemological lead in this regard. And Kant's point of departure is not only Kant's epistemology of phenomena, but also Kant's ethics of autonomy. Through the medium of Hegel, Kant's going to continue to shape the rest of the German idealist tradition and even beyond philosophy is going to have an influence on modern thought. Thus it is that German idealism runs from Descartes to South. Uh, that seems a little weird to state, but I hope uh, now uh, having listened to what I've had to say, it makes a little more sense. From Descartes to South and beyond. So now we're ready to go on and to consider that major, major work, uh, The Phenomenology of Mind by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. And that's our next lecture.